Welcome, friends, to worship with Edgewood United Church. I am Pastor Liz Miller. It is an honor and a blessing to be joining together in worship, uniting our spirits across our homes as one united church. Today is the second week of Advent, starting the second week of Advent, a week when we explore peace, what is needed for peace, what peace looks like, what it means to be a peacemaker or a messenger of peace. Peace has been something that's been talked about a lot this year because many of us have felt its absence as our lives have been shaken up, as there has been upheaval around us in our families, in our workplaces, across the globe. So surely we are a people who are longing for peace this season. This morning, I want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Especially if you are new, a first-time visitor. Especially if you are looking for a place where you will be loved and welcomed unconditionally. If you are someone who has been serving in the front lines in our medical community, if you are a teacher or an educator just hoping to make it to the finish line of the semester, if you are a student or parent of a student who is hoping to make it to the finish line of this strange semester, if you are longing for the comfort and familiarity of community, of friendship and family around you, if you are someone who is missing someone or some place today, or someone who is carrying grief with you or stress, you are welcome here. We mean it when we say no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Let us prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into this time of worship. Please join me in the call to worship. John the Baptist said, prepare the way. So, friends of faith, how do we prepare our minds for worship? We silence the inner critic. We let go of busy thoughts. We make space for God to speak. How do we prepare our hearts for worship? We bless all emotions. We feel what we feel. We open ourselves up to be moved. How do we prepare our bodies for worship? We take in the scent, sight, and feel of this space. We breathe in God's mercy. We exhale God's love. How do we prepare our souls for worship? We bring our full selves into this space. We wear our hearts on our sleeves. We trust that even now, God is here. Friends of faith, what we practice in worship, we must live out in our daily lives. So prepare the way. Let us worship holy God.
We dream, I dream of the first pitch of the opening season. I dream of a laundry day where each sock finds its mate. I dream of a family home for the holidays. I dream of good bucks and homemade meals. I dream of sunset drives with the windows down. These are beautiful dreams, but I also have urgent dreams. I dream of a conversation across party lines. I dream, I dream of more bridges and less walls. I dream of more laughter and less fear. I dream for less, for listening and less tears. But most of all, I dream for a peace like, like a river. Today, we light the candle of peace. God of peace, we must admit there are a million things on our minds. We would like to be as focused as John the Baptist, preparing the way, gathering the crowd, spreading the word of your arrival. Maybe then we'd know peace. However, more often than not, we are a swirling compilation of grocery lists, text messages, emails, and over-referenced to-do lists. So today, we ask for your help in preparing the way. Could you start with our ears and then maybe move to our hearts? We'd like to hear you more clearly. Maybe then we'll know peace. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you. We're going to read the story this morning of Who Built the Stable. Have you ever wondered who built the stable where baby Jesus laid? Was it built of bricks or was it built maybe of clay? We all know that Mary and Joseph traveled so far to find shelter on Christmas Eve night. And we all know that they were offered the only room in town in a stable and we all know that their roommates were donkeys and oxen and lambs. But what we don't know is who built that stable where the baby Jesus laid? Who built the stable where the baby Jesus laid? Was it built of bricks? Was it built of clay? Was it built of wooden sticks? Was it built of sod? Was it made by human hands? Was it built by God? A child built the stable, a little shepherd boy. He was apprenticed as a carpenter in his father's employ. He built the wooden stable for his donkey, ox, and sheep. It was a shelter from the weather and a home at night for sleep. He watered them at sunrise where they would graze and freely roam. And he called to them at sunset, follow me, and he led them home. When G was Jesus born in Italy, Russia, Spain, or Japan? No, he was born in Bethlehem, a rich and verdant land. How did Joseph and pregnant Mary find a place to stay? When they went knock, knock, knocking and were always turned away. The little shepherd sheltered them. For one night he saw a star, and lo, it grew in brightness, approaching from afar. He looked about in wonder, and there came into his sight a poor man and a woman wandering in the night. 
the boy asked, Can I help you? And gently, Mary spoke to him. My child will soon be born, she said, and there's no room in the inn. Oh, oh, come with me, the boy exclaimed. My stable's a warm place. My animals will welcome you. I'll sweep and clear a space. He made a bin, the cradle, of straw and new mown hay, and when it done, the child was born, he in the manger lay. The boy looked in the infant's eyes, and in his heart he knew that baby would be a carpenter. And that's the story of Who Built the Stable by Ashley Bryan. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There's a light to come into our darkness. There's a light to come in our day. There's a light to come into our darkness. Come, O light, and shine today. There's a light to come into our darkness. Come, O light, and shine today. There's a king to come for his kingdom. There's a king to come to save his The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen.
This weekend was the eighth anniversary of the death of Nelson Mandela. His legacy is as the great anti-apartheid and anti-racism leader, a mediator and practitioner of reconciliation, an expert on conflict resolution. But long ago, especially early in his life, Mandela was considered an outlier by those he confronted. He was a rebel, someone to be feared and silenced. Mandela spoke hard truths to people who were not ready to hear them. He was part of a long tradition of prophetic leaders proclaiming the way to justice, urging others to join him in transforming a system of oppression and building a new future for South Africa, one that was not based on the color of one's skin. His words that are remembered as pithy, inspirational quotes today were the same words that landed him in prison and had him labeled as treasonous. We remember him as a peacemaker, but he was once known as an inciter of violence. When I start thinking about what it takes to be a peacemaker, I think of great leaders like Nelson Mandela, like Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez, leaders who spent most of their time in the public making people angry, creating tension and controversy through their activism. In the moment, it must have felt like anything except peace. But ultimately, they were part of movements that paved the way for what we would now consider great strides towards peace and justice. Today, there is a new generation of activist leaders who do their work in the midst of the same tension. The young adults in the Sunrise Movement advocating to protect the environment, the Black Lives Matter movement to defund the police, the Parkland activists to end gun violence. When these movements show up in the streets or amplify their voices, they are sometimes met with violence, sometimes with anger, sometimes with well-meaning folks who say, I support your ultimate goals, but I don't think we can get there yet, or your wording is wrong, or your hopes are too audacious. I just think you should tone it down a little. And still, these peacemakers persist, understanding that the way to peace is through justice, and the work of justice begins with calling out the systems that cause harm, the policies that are, that are inequitable, and pointing us toward a vision that is as transformational as it is challenging. This is the paradox of what it means to work for peace. To do so requires entering into conflict and tension, to name injustices and create a vision for the peace we long for them to transform into. Messengers who bring us dreams of peace are often the ones who stand apart from the crowd, who make us uncomfortable and who shout out words that are before their time meaning they might feel a little more radical than we are inclined to be. So it was with John the Baptist, clothed in camel's hair, eating locusts and wild honey. Hairy and an eater of bugs? No thanks. Before he started shouting, he would have stuck out from the crowd and caused more cautious folks to cross over to the other side of the dirt road when he came their way. His message wasn't much more inviting. Who wants to hear someone shouting that we need to repent and confess our sins? Every pride parade I've ever been to has at least one man standing off to the side shouting something with very similar language, and I happen to make a beeline away from them. 
The difference, though, between those men and John the Baptist is that instead of shouting a message of shame, John the Baptist proclaims a message that points toward God. God's peace is the one that we are called to look out for in the world, in our activism, and at home in our lives. It calls us to ask hard questions, to examine our relationships and our actions, and say, what is causing harm, either to myself or others? What would it mean to be in right relationship, to be grounded in love? What needs to change in order for me to find peace? Advent is not an easy season. It is a season of active preparation for a new way of being. In order to get to peace, we have to acknowledge what isn't working, what needs to change, and what peace will finally look like. John the Baptist's message is tied to the prophet Isaiah's prophecy saying what God is going to do in order for peace to prevail in the world and in our lives. I am sending my messenger ahead of you, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make the Lord's path straight. In Advent, we are reminded that God comes down to earth to be with us, to help us prepare to fill the valleys, those valleys that manifest as aching holes in our hearts, the holes that come from loss, from unsustainable relationships or patterns. God comes down to fill those with love. God looks at the mountains, the obstacles that seem too large to overcome, the paths that seem too steep or too treacherous to walk. And God lowers them, making them passable for even the most timid adventurer, restoring hope to the hopeless. God makes our path straight, which has nothing to do with what gender you are attracted to and everything to do with taking the things that seem out of line and downright messed up and God straightens them out until things make sense again, until things are going in the direction they are supposed to. In Advent, we are reminded that when God is present among us, the rough ways will smooth. The impossible will find a solution. The difficulties will become simple. The pain will turn into healing. The chaos will turn into peace. Our messengers of peace are reminders of God's presence in the world. Reminders that God is moving us through conflict so that we can know peace that comes beyond justice. Our longing and preparing for peace at home are reminders that change is possible and that we are co-conspirators with God as the Holy Spirit weaves messages of peace throughout the world. This month, you may find yourself in moments that feel more like war instead of peace. Maybe a moment of frustration of not being able to go somewhere or see someone you would typically see this time of year. A moment when you are trapped in intense political conversation a moment when you realize your child's wish list is longer than Santa was planning on spending. In those moments, I hope that we will remember that God's peace surrounds us, that God is bringing peace to earth, our earth, and that those moments of stress and strife will soon fade into something much sweeter. May we look to the messengers of peace and lift up gratitude for the ways their strength withstands the conflict that change often brings and moves us toward peace for our lives, for the future, for all of earth. Amen.
Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Dear God, we believe that a voice cried out in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And so we show up to church, even online. We march toward justice. We roll up our sleeves. We plant trees for our children. We make art. We choose hope. We gather at the table. We set an extra plate. We sing loudly with joy. We share stories and wisdom. We celebrate children. We fall together. We rise together. We love together. We do all these things because we believe that God loves us so much that God shows up here. So we prepare and prepare for that next beautiful day. May it be so. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. The story is told that during the Blitz in World War II Britain, when the city was bombed, Operation Pied Piper evacuated many children to the country, but some remained in London and many of those were orphans. Some were sheltered in a Jesuit order of brothers who noticed the children had trouble falling asleep or staying asleep night after night. When the children were being put to bed one night, one of the brothers guessed the children's problem was that they were anxious because of the uncertainty in their lives and gave each child a small piece of bread, saying something like this, hold on to your piece of bread while you are sleeping. Remember when you woke up this morning, we fed you and took care of you. When you wake up tomorrow, we will be here for you. Let the bread remind you of this. Good night, children. And the children slept. So let us come to be comforted in the story of Bethlehem. In this, the house of bread, come to be comforted at this table by a handful of bread and a cup with love that will stay with you always.
We remember God's promises of Emmanuel and a branch of Jesse's root of leader, wisdom, monarch, key of all that is locked in dawn of every morning. And we remember the sacred story that happened in the house of bread for a new mother and a fostering father, sheep and shepherds, a few wise travelers with gifts, and many, many angels. And we remember that baby named Jesus grew up to heal people and teach them strange parables that made people angry. At Passover, he broke unleavened bread and poured wine and loved freely. So let us pray together now. In our lonely nights, under our guiding stars, with the hopes and fears of all our years, we come for comfort, for peace of mind and peace on earth, for a blessing on our hands and the bread in them, on our lips and the cup we lift to it. May this bread and cup be your holy life that we may ponder in our hearts and pray in our community. Amen. The holy child of Bethlehem descends to us and is born to us in these days. Let us share the bread. We hear the Christmas angels, their great glad tidings to tell. Let us drink greatly, for Christ abides with us. And let us pray. God, we give you thanks that you have come to us in the child of Bethlehem, in this bread and cup, and in your answer to all of our hopes and your offer of peace deeper than any truce, truer than the upheaval that surrounds us. You have comforted us with your presence and your promise so that we too may spread the welcome wings of your good tidings. Amen. This year on Christmas Eve, we will of course be worshiping online but we will be bringing our beloved traditions of that service into this new way of worship. So it'll be a service full of our favorite carols, Christmas carols, full of readings of the Christmas story, and of course, singing Silent Night and lighting candles. Now, each of us are invited to participate in our digital online candle lighting ritual and to do so I invite you to record a short video of yourself just like this where it's you and the camera and I've turned off the lights in here to to create the effect a little bit more of Christmas Eve and I have a candle with me and just outside to the right of me I have a second candle that is lit and when to record your video you're going to want to start like this make sure your candle is in view then pass it to the right to light it and then pass it off camera to the left as if you are passing that light on to the next person if there are multiple people in your household you can crowd next to one another as if you were in a pew and light each other's candle ending with the left side passing it out of view of the camera one final time we will compile these videos together into an epic christmas eve candle lighting ritual during silent night if you have any questions please feel free to ask um, I'd encourage you to record these early and get them in. 
They are due by December 20th. You can email them to me, Pastor Liz, at Edgewood UCC. We hope to have as many folks from the congregation, whether you are local or worshiping with us across the country, join together on Christmas Eve night. As we go out into the world, as we leave this time of worship, I pray that we will be bold in our peacemaking that we will loudly proclaim ourselves as messengers of peace, knowing that through the conflict, through the tension, justice will prevail. Peace will reign on earth. God's peace will reign on earth. I pray this, hoping you know that no matter where your journey takes you, the grace and peace of God will surely follow. Amen. <laughs>